Hey, this is AP Psychology, Chapter 3, Nature, Nurture, and Human Diversity. So, to what extent are we shaped by our heredity and to the degree by our life history? The conclusion is that nature is crucially important and nature is crucially important and nurture is crucially important are central in today's psychology. Genes provide the blueprints that design both our universal human attributes and our individual traits. Behavior geneticists explore individual differences. By using twin adoption and temperament studies, they assess the heritability of various traits and disorders. Their, their research indicates that both nature and nurture influence our life courses. We are products of interactions between our genetic predisposition and our surrounding environments. Molecular geneticists search for genes that put people at risk for genetically influenced disorders as potential benefits as well as risks. Evolutionary psychologists focus on what makes us alike as humans. They study how natural selection favored behavioral tendencies that contributed to survival and spread our genes, for example, in explaining gender differences in sexual behavior. They argue that women most often send their genes into the future by pairing wisely, uh, men by pairing widely. Critics maintain the evolutionary psychologists make too many hindsight explanations and underestimate the role of culture. Although genetics influences are pervasive, so are environmental influences. Nurture begins in the womb as embryos receive differing nutrition and varying levels of exposure to toxic agents. Sculpted by experience, neural conditions multiply rapidly after birth. Parents influence children's manners as well as their political and religious beliefs. Peers are important in learning cooperation for finding the road to popularity and for inventing styles of interaction among people of the same age. Cultural groups evolve norms or rules that govern members' behaviors. They vary their requirements for personal space, their expressiveness, and their pace of life. The third and their child rearing practices, individualist and collectivist cultures have different effects on personal identity. Differing sex chromosomes and differing concentrations of sex hormones lead to significant physiological sex differences, yet gender differences vary widely depending on culture. Culture variations in gender roles demonstrate their capacity for learning and adapting. Both social and cultural factors contribute to gender identity and gender typing. The biopsychosocial approach to development recognizes that we are products of both nature and nurture of genes and environment. We are also architects of our future. The stream of causation runs through our present choices. Members of the human family differ personality, interest, culture, and family background. At the same time, our shared brain architecture predisposes us to sense the world, develop language, and experience hunger through the same mechanisms. Humans everywhere affiliate, conform, and reciprocate favors to punish offenses and grieve a child's death. So behavior geneticists study our differences and weigh the relative effects of heredity and environment. In May 2002, a Harris poll of U.S. adults reported that, that when offered a free genetic test for a disease for which there is a treatment or other ways to greatly re reduce risk, 56% said they would be very likely to take it. However, when offered a free genetic test for disease for which there was no known treatment or any other ways to reduce the risk of disease, only 26% said they would, would be very likely to do so. When asked if you could have a comprehensive genetic test, which would tell you about the likelihood that you might have several major diseases and it was not expensive at all, how likely do you think you would be to have it? Very likely, somewhat likely or not likely. 39% indicated very likely, 30% indicated likely, 29% responded not very likely, and 2% were either not sure or refused to answer. 
Finally, when respondents were asked who should be allowed to see the results of their testing, 90% agreed that their doctor should see it. 39% said their health insurance company. 25% said their life insurance company from whom they may want to obtain a policy, and 17% indicated their employer. Thanks to mapping of the he human genome, scientists are rapidly identifying genetic codes for various diseases. Genetic tests are pres presently available for two dozen Ill illnesses, including Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, and Tay-Sachs disease. In some cases, the ability to predict is accompanied by the ability to cure. For example, the genetic predisposition to heredity, hereditary homeochromiostosis, a potentially fatal disease that causes iron to build up in the blood, is easily treated. On the other hand, Huntington's disease is, is incurable. Knowing your vulnerability is a mixed blessing at best. For some of the most worrisome development of genetics, age is the likelihood that of a person's genes will be used against them. A drop of blood or a lock of hair could tell a potential insurer or employer whether someone is at risk of contracting any of the long list of debilitating diseases. In 1993, James Tatum, a 43-year-old postal supervisor from Turlock, California, suddenly lost his sight. Although the U.S. Postal Service approved his request for disability retirement, the Department of Labor subsequently denied it, arguing that Tatum's blindness Blindness was caused by a genetic disorder. More recent American Management Association survey of 2,133 companies found at least seven using genetic testing on workers. In February 2001, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission filed its first genetic testing lawsuit in which it accused Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad of collecting, collecting genetic samples from employees without their consent. Apparently, the tests were used to evaluate compensation claims filed by workers suffering from carpal tunnel syndrome, a repetitive motion injury that may be linked to a genetic mutation. The workers claimed that the company was seeking to blame any future health problems on their genetic makeup rather than a tribute to physical stress on the job. In May of 2002, 36 railroad workers won a $2.2 million out-of-court settlement from Burlington. The Cambridge-based Council for Responsible Genetics has documented hundreds of cases of genetic discrimination in the health industry. For example, a healthy child was denied insurance because of a genetic predisposition to a heart disorder. At present, more than 47 states have laws against genetic discrimination in health insurance, and about 33 have laws against it in the workplace. Fears concerning the misuse of genetic information could be addressed with the legislative passage of clear national standards. Behavior geneticists study our differences and aim to determine the relative importance of heredity in the environment. Environment includes every non-genetic influence from uh, maternal nutrition while in the womb to people in the things around us. Every cell can, uh, nucleus contains the genetic master code for the body. Within each are 46 chromosomes with 23 donated from each parent. Each chromosome is composed of a coiled chain of molecule called DNA. G genes are DNA segments that when turned on form templates for the production of proteins. By directing the manufacture of proteins, the approximately 30,000 genes that compose the human body determine our individual biological development. The genome provides the co complete instructions for making an organism, consisting of all genetic material in the organism's chromosomes. Variations at particular gene sites in the DNA define each person's uniqueness. Human traits are influenced by genes com complexes, that is, by many genes acting in concert. The genome is, uh, is a set of complete instructions for making an or organism containing all the genes in that organism. Thus, the human genome makes us the human, and the genome from Dropsphilia makes the common house fly.
comparison of identical twins who are genetic clones and fraternal twins who develop separate eggs have behavior genetics tease apart effects of hereditary heredity and environment research findings show that identical twins are much more similar than fraternal in abilities personality and even interests genes matter the discovery that identical twins separated at birth show remarkable similarities also suggests the genetic influence indeed separated indeed separated fraternal twins do not exhibit exhibit similarities comparable to those separated identical twins genes also influence the social effects of such traits adoption studies enable comparisons with both genetic and environmental relatives adoptees traits bear more similarities to their biological parents and to their caregiving adoptive parents Nonetheless, the later do influence their children's attitudes, values, manners, faith, and politics. Clearly, nature and nurture shape one's developing personality. The Minnesota study of twins reared apart, directed by Thomas Bouchard, has two parts. The first part began in 1979 and involved a week-long medical and psychological assessment of identical and fraternal twins separated in early life and reared apart. The psychological assessment included multiple measures of personality, mental abilities, values, interests, uh, psychomotor skills, reading, spelling, and writing. The medical assessment involved psychiatric interview, a medical life history, a standard blood battery, and even detailed dental and periodontal exams. The second part of the study is a 10-year longitudinal study of aging. Adult twins who were between the ages of 24 to 66. At first assessment, return to the Minnesota for a repeat of initial assessment. This massive study provides many examples of separated identical twins showing remarkable similarities. Separated infants twins, Gerald or Jerry, Levy and Mark Newman grew up to share characteristics ranging from their firefighting avocation to taste in beer. Neither knew of the other's existence until a shared acquaintance brought them together. Upon meeting for the first time, each saw his own reflection. They had grown the same mustache and sideburns, and each wore the same glasses. As the brothers talked, they discovered they had more, co more than common and looks in common. Levy went to college and grad graduated with a degree in forestry. Newman planned to go to college to study the same subject, but opted to work for city trimming trees. Both worked for a time in supermarkets. Levy had a job installing sprinkler systems until recently Newman had a job installing fire alarms. Both men are bachelors, attracted to similar women, tall, slender, long hair. In addition to being volunteer firemen, they both share favorite pastimes of hunting, fishing, and going to the beach, watching old John Wayne movies and pro wrestling and eating Chinese food in the wee hours after a night on the town. Both were raised in the Jewish faith, but neither is particularly religious. Both men drink only Budweiser beer, holding the can with one pinky curled underneath and crushing the can when it's empty. In becoming acquainted, observes Jerry, we kept making the same remarks the same time and using the same gestures. It was spooky, he said. He, I, am, I, we are one. The twins in Minnesota study completed a number of interviews and tests. Thomas Bouchard and his colleagues reported that heredity accounted for 64 to 74% of the differences seen in IQ between identical twins. Previous studies found that heredity explained 47 to 58% of the variance. The multidimensional personality questionnaire, the MPQ, evaluated twins for impulsiveness, aggressiveness, and need for achievement, traditionalism, stress reactions, sense of well-being, social potency, including tra traits such as leadership, social closeness, alienation, harm avoidance, and absorption for proneness to imaginative activities. In each of these areas, researchers found her heritability of about one half of the figures range from 39% for achievement to 55% for harm avoidance. The researchers emphasize the significance of the finding is that heritable, the heritabilities were found at all more surprising is that all hovered at about 50%. 
it was wise to remind Uh, for example, 90% of the variation in people's height is genetic and 10% is environmental. These figures apply to the population as a whole, not to individuals. We do not say that 90% of your height is influenced by genetic factors and the 10% by environmental factors. Rather, that the ratio represents the proportion of differences among the people that can be explained by genes or environmental influences. Clearly, the Minnesota study does not provide a perfect assessment of heredity's contribution to our traits. It has led to some questions about the reliability of the twin studies. For example, separated identical twins shared the same prenatal environment if those nine months are crucial in determining how the brain is wired, environment is already having a significant impact before birth. This would help explain why fraternal twins, who are no more alike genetically than any brother and sister, have IQs more alike than ordinary siblings. Moreover, separated identical twins are rarely separated at the moment of birth. The twins in the Minnesota study had on average five months together before they were separated. If the first six months of life are indeed important, environment could still be contributing to similar personality traits. Finally, after the reunion, the twins averaged nearly two years together before they participated in the study. Naturally, the researchers paid special attention to the similarities and may, as some critics have argued, some have come to mythologize the twins' relationship. A number of studies compared these identical twins and raised separately from birth and close thereafter and found numerous similarities, such as personality, intelligence, abilities and attitudes, interests and fears, brain waves, and heart rates. However, critics of these separated twin studies, as noted, uh, note that such similarities can be found between strangers. Researchers point out that the differences between fraternal twins are greater than identical twins. Adoption studies, as opposed to twin studies, suggest that adoptees who may buy be biologically unrelated tend to be different from their adoptive parents and siblings. Adoptive studies strongly point to the simple fact that biologically related children turn out to be different in a family. So investigators ask the question, do siblings have differing experiences? Do siblings, despite sharing half of their genes, have different combinations of the other half of their genes? An ultimate question, does parenting have an effect? Parenting does have an effect on biologically related and unrelated children. It affects their attitudes, values, their manners, their beliefs, their faiths, and politics. Temperament refers to a person's stable emotional reactivity and intensity. Identical twins express similar temperaments, suggesting heredity predisposes temperament. An infant's temperament includes an inborn excitability. From the first weeks of life, some babies are more relaxed and cheerful, while others are more tense and irritable. These differences in temperament tend to endure. For example, the most emotionally intense preschoolers tend to be relatively intense as young adults. Compared with fraternal twins, identical twins have more similar temperaments. Thomas Bouchard provides a succinct survey of the research findings of how much genes influence human psychological traits. There is now a large body of evidence that supports the conclusion that individual differences in most, if not all, reliably measured psychological traits, normally and abnormal, are substantially influenced by genetic factors. He then breaks down the findings for personality, intelligence, and psychological interests and psych psychiatric illness and social attitudes. Of special interest is Beauchamp's observation that in early behavior, geneticists' assumption that some psychological traits were likely to be significantly influenced by genetic factors, whereas others were likely to be primarily influenced by shared environmental influences, has proven wrong. Heritabilities differ less from their trait or trait than anyone initially imagined. Most psychological traits are moderately heritable. 
this may be general biological phenomena rather than one specific to human psychological traits. More specifically, the profile of genetics and environmental influences on psychological traits is not that it different from profiles in these influences on similarly complex physical traits. In addition, your such findings apply to most organisms. Presenting Bouchard's findings provides a good opportunity to reinforce the concept of heritability as presented in the text. Heritability refers to the extent to which variation among individuals can be attributed to their differing genes. Thus, to say that heritability of happiness is, say, 50% does not mean that your happiness is 50%. Rather, it means that we can attribute the genetic influence of 50% of the observed variation in happiness among people. Some of the following are Brochard's findings by category. Personality. Organizing traits into the big five, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness. And the big three, positive emotionality, negative emotionality, and constraint. Bouchard reports that genetic influence is the range of, of 40 to 50 percent, that heritability is approximately the same for different traits. Some large studies have examined whether the genes that influence personality traits differ in the sexes. The answer seems to be no mental ability early in life shared environmental factors or dominant influences in on iq gradually de genetic influences increase uh, for example bouchard reports heritability of 0.22 at age five at old age at 75 plus it is 0.54 to 0.62 Psychological interests, little variation in heritability is reported for realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional interest. It averages 0.36. Psychiatric illness, the most extensive studied psychological disorder is schizophrenia, and it shows a high degree of genetic influence. Heritability is about 0.8. Major depression is less heritable at 0.4. The heritable, heritability of anxiety disorder is 0.2 to 0.4. Alcoholism is in the range of 0.5 to 0.6. And antisocial personality disorder ranges from 0.41 to 0.46. Social attitudes, twin studies show only environmental influence on conservatism up to age 19. After this age, heritability increases, with one large study yielding heritabilities of 0.65 for males and 0.45 for females in adulthood. Religiousness is only slightly heritable, 0.11 to 0.22. In the 16-year-olds, for adults, it is in 0.30 to 0.45 range. Membership in the specific religious denomination is largely due to environmental factors. Heritability refers to the extent to which these differences among people are attributable to their genes. If the genetic influences help explain individual diversity traits, can the same be said about group differences? Not necessarily. Individual differences in weight and height are heritable, and yet nutritional influences have made Westerners heavier and taller than their ancestors were a century ago. Some human traits are fixed, such as having two eyes, However, most psychological traits are liable to change with environmental experiences. Using twin adoption methods, behavior geneticists can mathematically estimate the heritability of any trait. The extent to which variation among individuals is due to their differing ages. If heritable intelligence is 50%, this does not mean that one's intelligence is 50% genetic. Instead, it means that we can attribute to the genetic influence 50% of the observed variation among people. The heritability of specific trait may vary, depending on the range of populations and environments studied. As an environments become similar, heredity as source differences becomes more important. Our genes affect how our environment reacts to influences us. Nature enables nurture. Heritable individual differences need not 
imply heritable group differences. Genes and environment work together. Because of human adaptability, most psychological interesting traits are expressed in the particular environments. In other words, genes are self-regulating and they can react differently in different environments. Some human traits are fixed, such as having two eyes. However, most psychological traits are liable to change with environmental experience. Genes provide choices for the organism to change its form or traits when environmental variables change. Therefore, genes are pliable or self-regulating. Genes can influence traits which affect the responses and environment can affect gene activity. A genetic predisposition that makes a child restless and hyperactive evokes an angry response from his parents. A stressful environment can trigger genes to manufacture neurotransmitters that will lead to depression. Genes and environment affect our traits individually, but more important are their interactive effects. Molecular genetics is a branch extension of behavior genetics that asks the question, do genes influence our behavior? We are products of our interactions between our genetic predisposition and our surrounding environments. A baby who is genetically predisposed to the social easygoing may, in contrast to one who is less so, attract more affectionate, stimulating care and thus develop into a warmer, more outgoing person. Similarly, a stressful environment can trigger genes that affect the production of neurotransmitters that underlie depression. In case you can, in, Randy and Larson and David Buss's recent review of the literature on three types of genotype environment correlation. Passive genotype correlation occurs when parents provide genes in the environment to children but the children have done nothing to elicit their parents' responses. For example, children, for example, parents are highly ver verbal. They may also buy lots of books. A significant correlation between children's verbal ability and the number of books in their home is passive and the child has done nothing to affect the presence of books. Reactive genotype environment correlation occurs when parents respond differently to children depending on each child's genotype and behavior. Some babies may love to be touched and cuddled. Others are more aloof. Parents may start treating their children the same, but over time, because of children's different responses, they cuddle one more than the other. As a result, differences in the ch children's sociability grow. Active genotype environment correlation occurs when a person with certain genetic predispositions selects a particular environment. For example, a high sensation seeker may seek risky environments, skydiving, motorcycle riding, jump, uh, jumping, even drug taking. Very intelligent individuals may read books, attend lectures, and engage other vigor others in vigorous debate. This act of selection of environment has been called niche picking and vividly demonstrates how we are not merely passive recipients of our environments, but we mold and create them. They in turn mold us. Larson and Buss make the important point that genotype and environment correlations may be positive or negative. This environments encourage and discourage the expression of specific genetic predispositions. Parents of very active children may try to get them to calm down, while parents of more passive children may try to foster liveliness. People who are very outspoken may be positively reinforced by approving audience, but they may also elicit a negative reaction from others who try to bring them down to size. Molecular geneticists are trying to identify genes that put people at risk for disorders. With this kind of knowledge, parents can decide about pregnancies and which fetus is suspected of having such disorder. However, this opens up real concern regarding ethical issues involving such choice. Molecular genetic studies, why we as organisms are distinct. 
where evolutionary psychology studies why we humans are alike. In particular, it studies the evolution of behavior and mind using principles of selection. In dozens of labs worldwide, molecular geneticists are teaming with psychologists in the search for genes that put people at risk for genetically influenced disorders. Potentially, steps may be taken to prevent problems before they happen. With this benefit, however, also comes risks of labeling people in, in ways that may lead to discrimination. Prenatal screening also poses hopeful possibilities and difficult problems as parents become able to select the traits in countries where boys are highly valued. Uh, testing for an offspring sex has enabled selective abortions. Millions of parents will select for health and perhaps for brains and beauty and athleticism. However, by selecting our certain traits, we may deprive ourselves of future Handels, Van Goghs, Lincolns, Dickinsons, all who were troubled people. As indicated in the text, research developments already make it possible for parents to choose their child's sex before conception with reasonable chance of success. Medical personnel may soon be able to give parents a readout on how their fetus genes differ from normal pattern and what this might mean. With the gene therapy, scientists say they will be able to change the child's characteristics before she or he is born. Clearly, in the future, scientists will be able to cure a child's inherited disease before birth. Until fairly recently, gene therapy has meant placing a healthy gene into the cells of one organ of the patient suffering from a genetic disease. Now it may mean altering a fertilized egg so that the genes in all one person's cell including eggs and sperm, carry a gene that scientists not, not the parents placed there, the germline, eggs and sperm. Therapy would actually allow us to take control of our own evolution. Many bioethicists are sympathetic to shielding a child from family disposition to cancer, Alzheimer's, or Alzheimer's disease. But what about other characteristics? How about a child's sexual orientation, intelligence, or specific talents, such as musical ability, that only has would be able to genetically engineer their children? As R Richard Ely asks, should parental screening for certain behaviors be mandatory? Should screening for other behaviors be prohibited? To what degree would the availability use of pre- natal screening create a de facto eugenic society. One development of it, development addresses the concern that no one's genes, not even in embryos, should be altered without his or her permission. UCA gen, UCLA geneticist John Campbell suggests that designer genes may be paired off with an on or off switch. The child would take the drug to activate the gene, free to accept or reject the drug. The child retains informed consent over his or her genetic endowment. Researchers are also experimenting with drugs that make the introduced gene self-destruct in cells that become eggs or sperms, confining such gene tinkering to one generation. Thus, if researchers later discovered that eliminating genes for mental illness also erased genes for creativity, they could prevent the loss from becoming permanent part of humankind genetic blueprint. Evolutionary psychologists focus on what makes us much alike as humans. They study how natural selection has shaped our universal behavioral tendencies. Natural selection is an evolutionary process through which adaptive traits are passed on to ongoing generations because these traits help animals survive and reproduce. Peter Gray of Boston College suggests that evolutionary perspective is useful in raising why, the why of behavior question that is so central to the discipline of psychology. For example, universal human characteristics, characteristics as characteristic, we can ask why. The kinds of explanations can be compatible and show how the different perspectives are complementary. 
Gray also notes that the evolutionary perspective may help be helpful in overcoming students' tendency to equate psychology with psychopathology. Focusing on potential evolutionary value behaviors combats this pathology bias. As an example, Grace cites children's bedtime protests, which in our culture is often uh, presented in a pathological terms as evidence of a spoiled child. Someone may answer that the children resist because they are afraid of being alone in the dark. In the hunter-gatherer days, being alone in the dark was dangerous, for monsters were real. Children were prote uh, protested and attracted adult attention were more likely to sur survive. This analysis is supported by cross-cultural data. Indeed, present-day hunter-gatherers believe that putting a child to bed alone is child abuse. In cultures where children sleep with an adult, bedtime protest is almost absent. To address the practical implications of evolutionary theory, Timothy Miller's How Want how to want what you have can be a helpful resource. It was the first self-help book written from an explicitly evolutionary perspective. After providing lucid explanation of the perspective's emphasis on the importance of reproductive success, Miller shows how humans strive for prerequisites of wealth, status, and love. The fundamental problem, suggests Miller, is that from an evolutionary perspective, there is no such thing as enough reproductive success. Thus, we are instinctively driven to keep striving for more and more success, more love, regardless of how much we have already achieved. This leads to incredible suffering and unhappiness. Miller's prescription for remedying this unhappiness is intriguing because it suggests that people are not compelled to follow their instinctive cravings. It writes, he writes, we have sufficient intellectual capacity that we can ignore or override our instinctual inclinations. If we have good enough reason, people can learn what they have. Your best hope is to spit in, spit in instinct's eyes. Miller's methods for coming to want what we have involve the deliberate, con constant practice of compassion, attention, and gratitude. Natural selection is the principle that among the range of inherited trait variations, those that lead to increased reproduction and survival will most likely be passed on to succeeding generations. Nature selects beneficial variations from among mutations, ra uh, random errors in gene replication, and new gene combinations produced at each human conception. During human ancestry, genes that enable today's capacity to learn and to adapt it had survival value. Similarly, we love the taste of fats and sweet, which once were hard to come by, but which prepared our ancestors to survive famines. This particular natural disposition is mismatched with today's junk food environment. Biologist Belia Ventrut were able to artificially rear and domesticate wild foxes, selecting them for their friendly traits. Any trait that is favored naturally or artificially spreads to the future generations. A number of human traits have been identified as a result of pressures afforded by natural selection. Why do infants fear strangers when they become mobile? Why are most parents so passionately devoted to their children? And why do people feel spiders, fear spiders and snakes, not electricity and guns? Gender refers to biologically and socially influenced characteristics by which people define male and female. One of the largest reported gender differences is woman's greater disapproval of and lesser willingness to engage in casual, uncommitted sex. In comparison to women, men think more about sex, masturbate more often, and are more likely to initiate sex and make more sacrifices to gain sex. Men also have a lower threshold for perceiving warm responses as a sexual come on. The unfortunate response can range from sexual harassment to date rape.
Natural selection has caused males to tend their, send their genes into the future by mating with multiple females since males have lower costs involved. However, females select one mature and caring male because of the higher cost involved with pregnancy and nursing. Latita Peplu provides a comprehensive survey of the research on differences in human sexuality and the complements and extends the coverage that you see in the text. Her recent review identifies four important differences that you might, sh might be concerned with. She notes that these differences are large in comparison to other female differences studied by psychologists. First, as a as the text suggests, men show greater sexual desire than do women uh, of a variety of measures. Men think about, think more about sex, report more frequent sex fantasies, and across the lifespan rate their strength of their sexual drive higher than do their female age mates. Men are more likely than women to masturbate, begin masturbating at an earlier age, and tend to do so more frequently. In homosexual couples, lesbians report having sex less often than gay men or heterosexuals. Women appear more willing than men to forgo sex or adhere to religious vows of celibacy. A, sec a second consistent gender, gender difference is that women tend to emphasize committed relationships as context for sexuality more than men do. For example, when young adults are asked to define sexual desire, Men are more likely than women do to emphasize physical pleasure and sexual intercourse. Women are more likely to romanticize the sexual experience, reflected in one young woman's definition of sexual desire, as longing to be emotionally intimate and to express love for another person. Women's sexual fantasies are more likely than men's to involve familiar partner and to include, in, include affection and commitment. Men's fantasies are more likely to involve strangers, multiple partners, and focus on specific sex acts. The third aggression is a third aggression is more closely linked to sexuality for men than for women. For example, when asked to describe their own sexuality, men's sexual self concepts often include being powerful, experienced, domineering, and individualistic. There is no equivalent aggression dimension for women's sexual self-concepts. In heterosexual relationships, men are typically more assertive than women and take the lead in sexual interactions. Moreover, physical, physical, physically coercive sex is primarily a male activity. Finally, in comparison to men's sexuality, women's sexuality grows greater plasticity. That is, women's sexual beliefs and behavior are more easily shaped by cultural, social, and situational factors. For example, college education is associated, associated with more liberal sexual attitudes and behavior, but this effect is greater for women than for men. The college experience seems to have a greater effect on liberalizing women's attitudes than it is on liberalizing men. Although college doubles the likelihood that a man identifies as gay or bisexual, it is associated with 900% increase in the percentage of women identifying as lesbian or bisexual. Moving to a new culture also has a greater effect on women's sexuality than on men's. Males look for youthful appearing females in order to pass their genes into the future, where females, on the other hand, look for maturity, dominance, affluence, and boldness in males. Evolutionary psychologists apply principles of natural selection to apply explain why women's more re relational and men's more recreational approaches to sex compared with the egg sperm are cheap while a woman cares for a single infant a man can spread his genes by impregnating other females women most often send their genes into the future by pairing wisely men by pairing widely women are increase their own and children's chances of survival by searching for mates with economic resources and social status. 
being attracted to healthy, fertile appearing partners increases men's chances for spreading their genes wildly. So do gender differences in sexual attitudes that evolutionary theory attempts to explain to different attitudes towards infidelity. Kinsey and his associates found that 36% of husbands and 25% of wives reported being unfaithful. A more recent survey found that among individuals born between 1953 and 1974, the figures were 27.6% for men and 26.2% for women. Gender difference in motivation for inf infidelity suggests that marital dissatisfaction tends to be higher among unfaithful women than unfaithful men, and that a male's infidelity is more likely than a female's to be one night stand, to involve someone of limited acquaintance and to include sexual intercourse. Clearly, caution must be exercised uh, on, in relying on self-report, particularly on such sensitive issues. In exploring psychology of jealousy, research has most commonly found that men and women do not differ in either their frequency or magnitude of jealousy they experience. An ev evolutionary analysis, however, suggests that while both sexes will experience jealousy, they differ in sensitivity to the cues that trigger jealousy. Pose this question to you. Uh, so would, would you be more distressed if you found your romantic partner, one, having sexual intercourse with someone else, or was becoming emotionally involved with someone else? David Buss reports that 511 college students were asked to compare these two distressing events. 83% of women found that their partner's emotional infidelity more upsetting, whereas only 40% of the men did. In contrast, 60% of men experienced their partner's sexual infidelity, infidelity is more upsetting, and only 17% of the women did. Evolutionary psychology suggests that this answer largely revolves around the question of paternal uncertainty. Males never have absolute certainty of their biological parentage, whereas females do. In pursuit of reproductive success, a male must always consider the possibility that he is investing all his resources into another man's child. As Buss explains, sexual jealousy is one psychological mechanism that has evolved in men to combat the potential costs of being cockolded. For women, the greater concern is that the, her partner may channel his time and attention and effort to another female and her children. Freed from the anxiety of surrounding the biological parentage of her offspring, she is more sensitive to the possibility of male abandonment, for it would decrease the survivability of her children. Thus, she is more concerned about her partner's emotional involvement with another woman. Critics argue that evolutionary psychologists start with an, with an effect gender sexuality difference, for example, and work backward to propose an explanation. In addition, much of, the, of who we are is not hardwired. Cultural expectations shape genders. Still others suggest that evolutionary explanations may undercut moral responsibility for sexual behavior. In response, evolutionary psychologists point to the evolutionary power of their theoretical principles, especially those offering testable predictions. They also note that understanding our propensities may help us overcome them. Parents in early experiences, we have, we have looked at how genes influence our developmental differences. What about the environment? How do our early experiences of our family, community, and culture affect these differences? Parents in early, uh, we begin with the prenatal environment. Identical twins who share the same placenta are more like th those who do not, suggesting prenatal influences on psychological, on influences on psychological.
in the womb, embryos receive different nutrients, uh, different nutrition, and varying levels of exposure to toxic agents. Even identical twins have may have separate placenta in which one may have a more advantageous placement that provides better nourishment and a better placement barrier against viruses. Early postnatal experiences affect the brain development. In Rosenweig's 1984 experiment showed that rats raised in enriched environments developed a thicker cortices than those that impoverished environments. Normal uh, stimulation during early years is critical for optimal brain development. After brain maturation provides us with an abundance of neural connections and experiences and preserves our activated connections and unused connections degenerate, a process called pruning. Experiences modify a rat's neural tissue at the very place in the brain that processes the experience throughout life. Sight, smells, touches, strength, and some neural pathways while others weaken from disuse. Early experiences during development in humans show remarkable improvements in music, languages, and arts. Brain development does not stop when, when we reach adulthood. Throughout our life, brain tissue continues to grow. A well-learned finger tapping task leads to more motor cortical neurons right in the baseline. So you can see in these pictures how it causes the brain growth. Parental influence is largely genetic and is essential in nurturing ch children. However, socializing factors also play an important role. Although raised in the same family, some children are greater risk takers. Parental influence is the clearest at the extremes. For example, an abused who becomes abusive and in love, but firmly handled children who become self-confident and socially competent. Parental influence is also reflected in children's political attitudes, religious beliefs, and personal manners. However, environmental influences typically account for less than 10% of children's personality differences. This finding suggests that parents be given less credit for their children's success, as well as less blame for their failures. Annie Murphy, Paul, Annie Murphy, Paul's answer to this question nicely complements the, this discussion. Despite the current emphasis on the role of heredity and environment, influences other than parenting and influencing characteristics, Paul shows how that there is still an important role for parents. As Paul notes, behavior geneticists do not see heredity as one-way dictation, but more as an influence through spirited rounds of call and response, with each phrase spoken by heredity summoning an answer from the environment. For example, David Rice argues that how parents respond to a ch child's genetically influenced characteristics makes a huge difference of how those traits are expressed. He sees the parent-child relationship as a translator of genetic influence, with the genotype providing the basic plot and parents giving its tone, assent, and ev emphasis. Rice refers to this gene-environment correlation as the relationship code claiming that it returns to parents some of your influence. His research, research once seemed to give genes. The story doesn't necessarily start with parents, says Rice. It starts with the kid and then the parent picks up on it. For Rice, the parent's role as an interpreter of language of heredity holds out an exciting possibility. If you could intervene with parents and get them to respond differently to tr troublesome behavior, you might be able to offset much of the genetic influence on negative traits. Stanley Greenspan, author of Growth of Mind, agrees, genes do not create certain general tendency, but parents can work with these tailoring their actions to the nervous system of the child. He argues that responses a child naturally elicits may not be his or her best interest. However, if parents consciously and deliberately give more appropriate responses, they can alter the child's behavior. 
For example, an infant with sluggish temperament may not respond as readily to his parents' advances as a baby with a more active nervous system. Parents might naturally respond by giving a child less attention, which in turn leads the child to become even more withdrawn. However, if parents resist this temptation and engage the baby with special enthusiasm, Greenspan says the child's behavior changes, advises Plowman. See what they like, what they're good at, and go with that. By offering those things that fit the children's genetic constitutions, parents are improving their goodness of fit with the environment. Parental influence may be most important for those traits that can, could easily become assets or liabilities. The same temperament that can make a criminal can make for a hot test pilot or astronaut. That kind of little boy, aggressive, fearless, and impulsive is hard to handle. It's easy for parents to give up and let him run wild or turn up on the heat in punishment and thereby alienate him and lose all control. But properly handled, this can be the kid who grows up to break the sound barrier. Lichen maintains that firm, conscientious, and responsive parents make the difference. Children, like adults, attempt to fit into a group by conforming. Peers are influential in such areas as learning to cooperate with others and gaining popularity and in developing interactions. Parental and peer influences are complementary. Parents are more influential when it comes to education, discipline, and responsibility, orderliness, charitableness, and ways of interacting with authority figures. Peers are more important for learning cooperation, for finding the road to popularity, and inventing styles of interaction among people of the same age. In part, similarity to peers may result from selection effect. Parents choose their neighborhoods and schools that supply the peers. Humans have the ability to evolve culture. Culture is composed of behaviors, ideas, and attitudes, values, traditions shared by a group. A culture is enduring behaviors, attitudes, and traditions shared by a large group of people transmitted from one generation to the next. Culture supports survival with social economic systems that enable us to eat fruit in the winter, surf the internet, and accumulate information. Our capacity for large language enables us to preserve innovations, pass them on to the next generation. Culture's accumulated knowledge has significantly increased life's expectancy over the last century. Cultures differ. Each Culture develops norms, rules for accepted and expected behavior. Men holding hands in Saudi Arabia is the norm, as is closer personal space, but not in American culture. Cultures change over time. The rate of this change may be extremely fast. In many Western countries, culture has rapidly changed over the past 40 years. This change cannot be attributed to changes in the human gene pool because ev genes evolve very slowly. Paul Rosen suggests five principles for understanding cultural differences in relation to individual differences that have long been the focus of psychological study. The differences between cultures seem bigger than in actual differences between individuals in these same cultures. There is often a great variation within culture, even those attitudes and behaviors that are specifically selected to highlight cultural differences for the elderly and in making a variety of moral judgments. More than 25% of Americans gave the traditional, res traditional response sh showing respect and submissiveness to an elder and more than 25% of Hindus gave a modern response. They do not show respect for the elderly merely because of their age. Two, behavioral differences. Between individuals from different cultures are likely to be larger than differences in their thoughts and feelings. It is easier, observes Rosen, to suggest behavior than mental events. 
It is often hard to observe, reinforce, or punish internal states. Specific instruction using model punishments and rewards is typically aimed at behavior. Cultures often foster preferences for certain thoughts, feelings, and actions. That is, they encourage their members to choose from among options that are naturally available to all humans. Thus, outsiders may not deeply feel important values of another culture, but they can fully understand them. More, for example, some Hindu, Brahmin, and American adults were asked to indicate which one of the following three terms did not belong with the other, anger, happiness, and shame. Americans chose happiness with Brahmins chose anger. For Americans, happiness is positive while anger and shame are negative. For Brahmins, anger is socially disruptive while happiness and shame are socially constructive. However, when alternative reasoning was explained, both groups of research participants immediately understood the other's choice. Valence is simply more salient to Americans and social effect is more salient to Brahmins. Rosen cites another example of cultural differences with free associations to food items. In response to the word chocolate, about 25% of American women reported fat, fatty, or fattening is one of the three words. No respondent from India did so. Rosen concludes that fat is simply a more salient aspect of chocolate for Americans, not that Indians are unaware of the relation between chocolate and fat. Four. Cultural differences are sometimes artifacts of social and physical environment. In short, mental differences may less, be less substantial than situational differences in understanding cultural differences. For example, food portions in food stores, restaurants, and cookbooks are smaller in France than they are in the United States. This is probably a major factor in accounting for the French being thinner than Americans. In addition, the French environment encourages physical activity because of the convenient location of small food stores near most homes, the more salient bicycle alternative for transportation, and the high cost of gasoline. None of these influences on food intake or activity need to be direct, directly represented in mental activity, although they surely promote the development of behavioral and mental habits over the long run. Five, in contemporary world, differences between cultures will generally be larger in the older generation than in the younger. For example, in recent decades, young adults from traditional cultures are more likely to wear modern Western clothing, while their grandparents continue to wear traditional clothing. The widespread availability of television and other aspects of globalization have meant that the younger people grow up more aware of alternative styles. College students are more likely to be similar around their world than they are their parents or grandparents. Cultures change over time. The rate of this change may be extremely fast. In the Western countries, culture has changed rapidly over the past 40 years. This change cannot be attributed to change in the human gene pool because genes evolve slowly. Sorry, I didn't mean to read that twice. If a culture nurtures an individual's personal identity, it is said to be individualist. But if a group identity is favored, then the culture is described to be collectivist. A collectivist support system can benefit group while the experienced disasters such as the 2005 earthquake in Pakistan. All culture groups evolve their own norms, their rules, their govern their members and behaviors. Although these rules sometimes seem oppressive, they also grease the social machinery. Cultures vary in their requirements for personal space, their expressiveness and their pace. While cultures collide, their differing norms may make us uncomfortable. Cultures do change over time, in addition to changes that some come with technological advances, cultures and changes in attitudes and behavior. For example, the greater experience independence today, women are less likely to endure the abusive relationship out of economic need. Many minority groups enjoy expanded human rights. Not all culture change is positive. For example, the last few decades, the United States has seen sharply increased rates of divorce, teen suicide, depression, and juvenile and violent crime. 
changes in the human gene pool evolve far too slowly to account for these rapid cultural chains. Individualist cultures value personal achievement and fulfillment as well as individual rights and liberties. Relationships are often temporary and casual. Er, confrontation is acceptable and morality is self-defined. Individualists tend to define identity in terms of personal traits and one's life task is to discover and express one's uniqueness. Collectivist cultures value groups goals and solidarity. Relationships tend to be close and enduring. Maintaining social harmony is important. Morality is duty-based. Collectivists derive their identity from belonging, and one's life task is to maintain social connections, fit in, and perform one's role. Individualist cultures like the Europeans and Americans raise their children as independent individuals, whereas collectivist cultures, typically Asians and Africans, raise their children as interdependent. Westernized cultures sees responsible, you are responsible for yourself, you follow your conscience, you discover your gifts, you be true to your, yourself, you should be independent. Asian and African cultures or collectivist cultures see it as responsible to the group, you have a priority to obedience, you should be true to your family and self, you should be loyal to your group, you should be interdependent. While people in individualistic cultures encourage independence in their children, those in collectivist cultures focus on emotional closeness. Children in collectivist cultures grow up with a stronger sense of family self. The diversity of child rearing practices make it clear that children can thrive under various systems. Despite diverse cultural backgrounds, humans are more similar than different in many ways. We same genetic profile, the life cycle capacity, um, capacity for language and biological needs are all similarities. Based on genetic makeup, males and females are alike. Since the majority of inherited genes, 45 chromosomes are unisex and are similar. Males and females differ biologically in body fat, muscle, height, onset of puberty, and life expectancy. Cross-cultural research shows, helps us appreciate both our cultural diversity and human kinship. We share the same genetic profile and life cycle as members of one species. We, we seem subject to the same psychological forces. Our different languages demonstrate universal, universal principles of grammar. Our varied tastes reflect common principles of hunger. Our different social behaviors show the same need to belong. Norms are rules that govern their members' behaviors. Males and females are similar in genetic makeup as well as levels of intelligence, vocabulary, self-esteem, and happiness. Males and females differ in body fat, muscle height, and life expectancy. Females are more vulnerable to depression, anxiety, and eating disorders. In contrast, males are more likely to commit suicide and suffer from alcoholism. They're also much more likely to be diagnosed with autism, color blindness, hyperactivity, and antisocial personalities. Men express themselves and behave in more aggressive ways than do women. This aggression gender gap appears in many cultures in various ages. In males, the nature of this aggression is physical. In surveys, men admit to more aggression than women, and experiments confirm that men tend to behave more aggressively, such as by delivering what they believe are painful shocks. The same difference is reflected in violent crime rates. The gender gap in physical aggression appears in many cultures and across various ages. In most societies, men are socially dominant, 
and are perceived as such. In 2005, men accounted for 84% of the governing parliaments. Throughout the world, men are perceived as more dominant, forceful, and independent, while women are viewed as more deferential, nutrient, and affiliative. In groups, leadership tends to go to males. In everyday behavior, men are more likely to talk assertively and to interrupt, to initiate touching, and to smile less, and to stare. Young and old, women form more connections, friendships with people than do men. Men emphasize freedom and self-reliance. In comparison to men, women are more concerned with making social connections. This gender difference surfaces early in children's play as teens and girls spend more time with friends and less time alone. In coping with stress, women more often turn to others for support. Women emphasize caring and often assuming responsibility for the very young and old. Both men and women indicate their friendship with women tend to be more intimate, enjoyable, and nurturing. Biological sex is determined by the 23rd pair of chromosomes. If the pair is XX, a female is produced. If the pair is XY, a male child is produced. In the mother's womb, the male fetus is exposed to testosterone because of the Y chromosome, which leads to the development of male genitalia. If low levels of testosterone are released in the uterus, the result is a female. Sexual differentiation is not only biological, but also psychological and social. However, genes and hormones play in a very important role in defining gender, especially altering the brain and influencing gender differences as a result. Our culture shapes our gender roles, expectations of how men and women are supposed to behave. Gender identity means how a person views himself or herself in terms of gender. Neuroscientist Larry Cahill provides an excellent review of research on the differences in architecture of the male and female brains. Until recently, notes Cahill, neuroscientists believe that brain differences were largely limited to those regions responsible for mating behavior. For example, the hypothalamus. However, he concludes over the last decade, investigators have documented an astonishing array of structural, chemical, and functional variations in the brains of males and females. According to Cahill, these differences may not only explain why more men than women enjoyed the Three Stooges, but also raise the possibility that we might need to develop sex-specific treatments for a host of conditions, including depression, addiction, schizophrenia, and post-traumatic stress syndrome. Of a particular interest is Cahill's review of research suggesting that some sex differences in the brain arise before a baby draws its first breath. For example, to determine whether long noted sex differences in toy preferences, for example, girls preferring dolls and boys liking toy trucks. Melissa Hines and Jereen Alexander of Texas A&M presented a group of velvet monkeys with a selection of toys, including rag dolls, trucks, and some gender neutral toys, such as picture books. They found that male monkeys spent more time playing with masculine toys than their female counterparts. Do the female monkeys spend more time interacting with the playthings typically preferred by girls? Both sexes spent equal time playing with the picture books because velvet monkeys are unlikely to be influenced by the social pressures of human culture. The results suggest that toy preferences in children result in least, at least in part from innate biological differences. Simon Baron Cohen and his colleagues at the University of Cambridge examined the origin of disparities in how people-centered male and female infants are. They found, for example, that one-year-old girls spend more time looking at their mothers than boys of the same age do. When these babies were shown two films, the girls looked longer at the film of a face, whereas the boys leaned toward the film of cars. 
viewing time was taken as measure of interest. Might these differences be due to the way adults treat boys and girls? Baron Cohen and his students took a video camera into the maternity ward to examine the preferences of babies that were only one day old. The infants saw either the friendly face of a live female student or a mechanical mobile that matched the color, size, and shape of the student's face, but scrambled her facial features. To avoid bias, the experimenters were unaware of each baby's sex during testing. The results indicated that girls spent more time looking at, stu at the student. The boys spent more time looking at the mechanical object. The difference in social interest was evident on the first day of life, suggesting we come out of the womb with some cognitive sex differences. Biological sex is determined by that 23rd pair of chromosomes, the sex chromosome. The member of the pair inherited from the mother is the X chromosome, the X female or Y chromosome male that comes from the father determines the child's sex. The Y chromosome triggers the production of a principal male sex hormone, testosterone, which in turn triggers the developmental external male sex organs. A female embryo exposed to excess testosterone is born with masculine appearing genitals. Until puberty, such females tend to act in a more aggressive tomboyish ways than is typical for most girls. The fact that people may treat such girls more like boys illustrates how early exposure to sex hormones affects both, both directly in our biological appearance and indirectly by influencing social experiences that shape us, thus the nature and nurture work together. Preliminary research confirms male-female differences in the brain areas with abundant sex hormone receptors during development. For example, during adulthood, the part of the frontal lobes involved in verbal fluency is thicker in women and part of their parietal lobes involved in space perception is thicker in men. Gender schema theory suggests that we learn a cultural recipe of how to be male or female, which influences our gender-based perceptions and behaviors. Social learning theory proposes that we learn gender behavior like any other behavior, reinforcement, punishment, and observation. Although biology influences our gender, gender is also socially constructed. Culture shapes our roles, a role is a cluster of prescribed actions. For example, gender roles are expectations about the way men and women behave vary across cultures and time. For instance, in nomadic societies of food gathering people, there is little division of, of labor by sex. Thus, boys and girls receive much the same upbringing. In agricultural societies, women stay close to home while men often roam more freely. Such societies typically socialize children into distinct gender roles. Even among industrialized countries, gender roles vary greatly, for example, in the expectation that life will be more satisfying when both spouses work and share child care. Society assigns each of us a social category of male and female. The result is our gender identity, our sense of being male or female. To varying degrees, we also become gender typed, acquiring a traditional male or female role. Social learning theory assumes that children learn gender linked behaviors by observing and imitating significant others and by being rewarded and punished. Gender schema theory assumes that children learn from their cultures a concept of what it means to be male or female and adjust their behavior accordingly. Nature and nurture jointly form us. That is, we are products of natural selection and heredity as well as cultural, family, peer, and media influences. But we are also open systems, and this is the creator that is, creators as well as creatures of our worlds. We just respond to the world's response to us. Our efforts to affiliate with others, cope with challenges, and build our personal strengths, values, and demonstrate how the stream of causation runs through our present choices. This completes chapter three on nature and nurture. 
Thank you.